The soldiers look like the people we in America have come to know as the Contras. However, these are actually day Indian warriors who long ago traded bows and spears for high-tech armament. The warriors are on patrol inside Nicaragua, fighting a war that has little in common with the Contras, nothing to do with overthrowing the Sandinista government, and does not involve U.S. tax dollars. It is a struggle whose only similarity to the Contra War is its almost daily loss of life. And there's no question in my mind that there's a very real Indian struggle going on. One for the very issues that Indian people in the United States have fought for for years, for centuries. And not only the United States, but all over North and South America, and indigenous peoples in other parts of the world also. Um, land, the ability to control their own resources, the ability to govern themselves, the ability just to live as they have for centuries without any kind of infer in interference or, or any kind of government trying to force them to be in a particular society. Albuquerque attorney Jim Anaya is a legal advisor to the Mosquito Indians and other tribes of Nicaragua who have been fighting the Sandinistas for the past five years. This day, he is in Costa Rica, the exile home of Nicaraguan Indian resistance leader Brooklyn Rivera. Rivera, most famous Indian leader in Nicaragua, and a year of exile has him anxious to return to the Indian region, both to meet with the warriors and to consult with villagers. Although Rivera coordinates the support for an army of hundreds of warriors, his supply system depends on traditional wooden canoes carved by hand out of the giant jungle trees in Costa Rica and Honduras. There is no money, he says, to buy fat boats. As he prepares for his first return to his homeland in a year, Rivera invites some notable North American Indian leaders to go along on this trip. Rivera wants the leaders, including Russell Means of the American Indian Movement, to witness the problems the Indian people of Nicaragua are experiencing under Sandinista rule. Rivera and others relate accounts of village bombings, mass murders, tortures, and arrests. Atrocities need to be exposed to the outside world. We are demanding all the Indian people and their organization to support the, our struggle because um, the future of the Indian people and elsewhere also depend of the result um, of our struggle in Nicaragua for justice and, and, and peace. Rivera is not the only Nicaraguan Indian who lives out of Nicaragua. This is a United Nations refugee camp in Costa Rica. More than a thousand indigenous Nicaraguans are crowded into a camp built for 500. Existence here is often reduced to fighting for one's share of a shipment of plantains. At this camp, and in others like it in both Costa Rica and Honduras, almost 25,000 Mosquito, Sumu, Rama, and Creole people seek haven from what they call the oppression of the Sandinista government. They want to stick something in your brains that can't hold in your brain. You know, it's not our system of living, that oppression. So, hey, give us a chance, man. You know, and it's no chance. So, well, then, you just have to do something, you know. And the only way, well, we had us to pull out. That's the reason you have plenty of us over here in Costa Rica. On the walls of their barracks, the refugees have painted murals depicting Sandinista boats and helicopters coming into quiet Indian villages. The refugees say that sometimes the soldiers arrest, torture, or kill people suspected of supporting the Indian resistance. So as the refugees continue to survive the best they can in the camp of their country, Rivera and his warriors and other indigenous resistance forces continue their efforts on both political and military fronts, engaged in what is to them a fight for their basic rights under Sandinista rule. They still deny to recognize the Indian Aboriginal rights for land, for self-government, 
for natural resources and, and so forth. Um, because of that, our people are still in the resistance. In betrayed by a Sandinista government, who have entered into our homelands and after reaching there have changed completely the promise that they had made unto us. The history of the Indian resistance dates back to colonial times. For more than a century, the mountain range that divides Nicaragua has also divided its people. The main Hispanic population has flourished land and moderate climate of the West, while the small indigenous population remained isolated in the harsh jungles and savanna of the East. While Spanish is the main language of the West, English and Indian languages are spoken in the Atlantic region. For centuries, the Indians and Creoles were seldom disturbed in their traditional ways of life until the Sandinista Revolution in 1979. The revolution brought a new government whose first Indian policies included uprooting thousands of families from recruiting India or using the food and shelter available in the villages. Despite the claim by the Indians that they would not join the Contras, their villages were edited, the huts burned, the crops and livestock destroyed. As the tribes were crammed into the rows of tin-roofed government huts, their tribal councils dissolved and their culture cast aside, the resistance force was born. I says, wait a minute. Think about your brothers, yes, that suffer in jail in Managua. Think about your brothers, them, that suffering in the jail right now. Think about your brothers, them, that die for our cause. Think about all of them that is out their home. That's why we are warriors. We are fighting. That's why we stand there to defend the Caragua. It's a war that we definitely know that we can win. Sandinista have the weapons, but they do not area. When they goes into the area, they lost the man. They goes crazy, they go wild. And all we have to stay on the side and just cut them down like wild bush. For the North American fact-finding team, it is a long, difficult voyage from the jungles of Costa Rica to the Indian region of Nicaragua. Traveling all day and all night, the voyage takes us many miles out to sea. The journey through Nicaraguan waters takes place at night to prevent detection by Sandinista airplanes and helicopters. However, even at night, our small vessel must still elude the searchlights of Nicaraguan gunboats, which constantly probe the dark waves. <laughs> Guarding miles of remote beach for days, the Nicaraguan warriors have been anxiously awaiting our arrival. They are very pleased to see their leader, Brooklyn Rivera, back on Indian soil, along with the other exiled leaders of the resistance who have come on the journey. Despite the air of happiness, not all vigilance has been abandoned. For the North Americans, the foreigners in this land, we realize that for the foreseeable future, we can no longer take things like safety and well-being for granted. It is a feeling to which we are not accustomed. For everyone who arrived in the boat, it has already been a grueling ordeal, but one that has just begun. Slowly, more and more warriors filter in from the surrounding jungles and beaches. Our boat is used to shuttle some of the fighters across the river delta in which we have landed. Their shouts hail the name of their resistance organization, the Surasata. Others are shuttled in by way of smaller dugouts that are soon to become a very familiar size, the main mode of transportation through the jungle rivers of Nicaragua's Atlantic Coast region. As darkness envelops the wilderness, we are whisked away to our first home here, a place called Kumwatla. We arrive late at night and do not meet its people until dawn. A community of just a few hundred mosquito people, 
Kumwatla is typical of many of the villages in the Indian region of Nicaragua. It is accessible only by boat or foot. There are no roads here, and of course, no luxuries like electricity or running water. The nearest medical clinics are two to three days away by dugout canoes. No medical teams are allowed by the Sandinista government to travel this region. The shortage of medical attention is a critical problem. Today, Kumwatla, like most other Indian villages, shows little remaining evidence of the ordeals its residents have had to endure in past years under Sandinista rule. Like many other villages, Kumwatla has almost recovered physically from its many Sandinista attacks. A few head of livestock have begun to replace those killed by government soldiers. However, that it was not that long ago that there was not a single chicken, pig, cow, or horse in the village. All had been killed by the Sandinistas, a regional policy which created a serious food shortage for scores of villages, thousands of people. Kumwatla residents also openly support the warriors of the Indian resistance, who freely walk through the village, armed and uniformed. It is the morning of our first full day inside Nicaragua, and a meeting of resistance leaders has been to acquaint them with the members of the North American expedition and allow everyone to express their thoughts as the trip gets underway in earnest. Inside Nicaragua now, in addition to activist Russell Means, is the president of the World Council of Indigenous People, Clem Charte. Also, the director of the Survival of American Indians Association, Hank Adams. Charte and Adams have been on several trips with government escorts into the Indian region that is fully controlled by the Sandinistas. However, this is their first chance to meet with resistors in the field and villagers without Sandinista soldiers or representatives present. The first words from the warriors are words of appreciation, explanation, and hope. We ask that you do whatever you can to help because it is not a struggle of a group or a person, but it is a struggle of a whole Indian nation. I am grateful for your visit because this is the first time Indian leaders like yourself have visited warriors during the field. Some others came once through Managua with the government, and the government showed them what the government wanted. They never saw the reality of our struggle. So we are proud of you because you have suffered a lot during your trip at sea, and now we'll learn the realities of our struggle. With the words and spirit of the young fighters we had met still fresh in our minds, we set out now for Indian country. For two weeks, we travel from village to village, often by boat, but often on foot, too. Eastern Nicaragua is a vast expanse of wilderness crossed by networks of trails and waterways, but very few roads. Sometimes, when separated from our boat, the trail becomes particularly difficult. To cross an interior river, we must lash equipment on crude bamboo rafts and swim them across. At each village, the people gather in community meetings to see their leader, Brooklyn Rivera, and to the North Americans who have come to hear about experiences with the Sandinista government, experiences from the past and those continuing today. We meet the woman who says she was held down by Sandinista soldiers who drove a truck back and forth over her arm until the arm came off. The villagers in one community take us to a mass grave where they say 13 leaders from three villages were machine gunned by government soldiers who then covered the bodies with gasoline and burned them. A Moravian church pastor accused of giving food to resistance fighters says a fellow pastor was summarily shot by Sandinista soldiers while he himself was imprisoned for two years, often stripped naked, tied to a chair, and tortured. In addition to individuals, the people say the Sandinistas have also targeted entire villages. Evidence includes huge bomb craters pockmarking many villages, craters that soon become ponds filled with rainwater. 
The villagers say many of the indirect impact of the deprivation of medical attention. In each community, the people show us they're ill and injured, hoping that we have brought medicine or knowledge that will help. The Sandinista government says it cannot allow the medical teams who have volunteered to go into the region because it is classified as a war zone. However, villagers say the government also promises medical care to those communities which renounce the Indian resistance, a bargain that has few takers. We have a complete lack of doctors and medicines. People suffer from all kinds of illnesses, but this is our struggle, and we hope that the resistance will continue because it is the most important cause for the future of our people. And so the death toll mounts. Village cemeteries are half filled with the tiny graves of children. Most felled not by bullets or shrapnel, but by a lack of medical care for even the simplest of illnesses. In Managua, the Sandinista government says it now admits that it has mishandled the population. The government is allowing most of the people who were placed in the relocation camps to go back to their traditional lands and reconstruct the destroyed villages. The government says it has also polled the Indian communities and drafted a grassroots autonomy plan to grant the villages self-rule. However, while Rivera's group Masurasata says it has maintained its specific demands for Indian control of Indian land, the recognition of tribal governments, and the protection of insurance and way of life, its members say the government is not sincere and not specific with its plan. The government recognizes that it made some big mistakes in dealing with the Indian people. We admit that, but now we are engaged in a revindication effort which will address all of the needs of the indigenous people, including the political aspects, economic aspects, and cultural aspects. Well, they are saying that they made many mistakes, but I doubt that those uh, atrocity and destruction that they have committed again, against our people it should be just uh, mistakes. I think that was a part of their policy um, of assimilation and forces integration of Indian people. Rivera's doubts about the Sandinista promises of autonomy are echoed unanimously in the villages visited by the North American team. We have told them clearly that we want Indian autonomy. We want our leader, Rivera, to be here in order to lead our people to a genuine Indian autonomy. We will never accept the autonomy the government wants to impose on us because they are just lying to our people. We want genuine Indian autonomy. We don't want the Spanish or Sandinista autonomy. The North American Indian leaders are moved by the unity, spirit, and character of the Indian people of and Nicaragua. Most people believe that the Indian wars are all, and because of that belief, Indian people from the Arctic Circle uh, to the tip of South America and Chile are living under death sentences. Death sentences to our person, our families, our tribes, our ways of life, our nations. I really want to come to say that I want to thank you for that you are giving us to lift that death, death sentence, to make life possible for all Indian people. You, every Indian village you go to is is one village, one people, with one mind, one heart, one worldview, one religion. They are not a confused people. Their youth know who they are and where they are going. They are not confused about their role in life. No, this is one people, and, and it's determining and self-sufficient people. You cannot, you cannot oppress, suppress, and repress self-determining people because they will fight back, and Ms. Sirisata is proof. I think the international community has to understand that the Sandinista government is not as pure as they like to, to believe they are and as other people make them out to be. It, it's a government like any other government and is capable and in fact has committed oppression, repression and in fact genocide. Give me some bullets there. Yeah. Bye, bye.
The routine of day-to-day -day life in the villages can often seem unperturbed by the ravages of the war. The days of fishing, hunting, and jungle farming to provide food for the thousands of families must go on. While the principal food here, as in most third world nations, is rice, a variety of wild roots and fruit also provide sustenance. Some of the more affluent villages, like Lapan, where tons of oranges are grown, have enough produce to sell some. It is a big event in Lapan when the government trucks occasionally come to pick up the goods being market. There are moments to relax in the villages. It is not uncommon to find young people here enjoying an afternoon game of backlot baseball. Another pastime is singing. Each village has a handful of guitar players and lots of willing vocalists. Sandinista warplanes have burst into the skies over Lyasiksa. It is Tuesday, January 21st, and we have taken Kapats. Our television camera is out of battery power, and with the still cameras down to just a few remaining frames of black and white film, the ensuing minutes are captured with still pictures and on a small audio cassette recorder carried by Clem Charté. It's got a rocket mount there, on the wing, under the wing. Fearing the arrival of Soviet-built helicopter gunships with Sandinista troops on board, hundreds of villagers and our group leave the huts and head for the jungle. Time the low-flying spotter plane passes over the rooftops of the huts, we dive for cover under the trees and bushes. Moments later, we again run. Running. Since Masurasata says technically a ceasefire exists, no shots have been fired yet, and Rivera orders the warriors to hold their fire. We, we cannot shoot first, because that day they are expecting that we shoot them, then they with 500 pounds. You, you see? They'll bring the, heli they'll bring the helicopters. Yeah, yeah. However, as everyone continues to hurry through the village, the ceasefire is brought to an abrupt end by a Sandinista pilot. No dive. No diving in. Okay. Get down. The blasts are from rockets fired by the sand lanes. The first explosions have critically injured two villagers. In later attacks this day, three mosquito warriors protecting the North American team are killed. Six others are wounded. In the following days, a complex escape plan is drafted by the Indian resistance, and two weeks after the bombing at Lyasiksa, the North American Indian leaders are secreted past a Sandinista coastal installation and escape to the sea. Sandinista newspapers and radio broadcasts quickly assert that the North Americans were members of the CIA and that Brooklyn Rivera is a pawn of the U.S. government. However, a few days later, when Rivera is invited to help support her request by the Reagan administration for $100 million for the Contra War, Rivera writes to the Secretary of State, George Schultz, We have repeatedly expressed the belief that the dominant forces within the UNO organization present a threat to our rights. The political program of those forces indicates a commitment to failed policies of the past. Those dominant forces are not a credible alternative to the Sandinistas, 
Accordingly, we must exercise extreme care in avoiding even the appearance that we may be an ally or tool of those forces. If we are tainted by them, our international credibility and our struggle for Indian liberation will be badly damaged. With the resistance unwilling to help overthrow a Sandinista government with which it hopes to someday reach peace, the Indians will remain alone, spurned by the Contra Army and its allies, and often engaged in combat with a Nicaraguan government the people feel is not listening. Yet there is hope. Of course, white Indian people are still alive, and we will still, in our resistance, there will be hope for our people to conquest uh, their rights. Uh, it's depend than our people, their forces, and the international support from our Indian brothers from other countries. <laughs> That is the only way to keep Nicaragua from becoming a second Cuba. The White House says it has no such plans 